Peace and welcome to the call check here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Roger Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. It is Monday, April the 15th. And folks, we got a lot to talk about. First, let's talk about a divided convention, how the DNC is preparing for its uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And some people are saying that it likens the 1968 convention with so much division going on between the White House and the constituents. Folks, we'll talk a little bit about that. Also, Rico Wade, the passing of hip hop pioneer who created the sound of Georgia, more specifically Atlanta, as he became the, one of the top uh, producers for major, major artists coming out of the Atlanta area, including Outkast and many more. We'll talk about his impact on, on the culture. Later on, we're gonna be checking in with Dr. Bridget for this week's Reclaim Your Wellness as we talk about bias testing for kidney transplant, drug shortage features, uh, how there's a drug shortage in the United States, and so much more. Stay with us. It's all happening on today's edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Let's go. Folks, welcome to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation. And it is Monday, April the 15th. It is tax day as well in this country. So hopefully, if you haven't had a chance, <laughs> make sure y'all do your personal and business taxes. But uh, we'll certainly talk a little bit about that later on. But today, folks, we got a fantastic show for you. I'm really excited. Of course, we're going to be uh, checking in with Dr. Bridget for this week's Reclaim Your Wellness. A lot of uh, medical news that we got to discuss. So that's going to be talked about. Talking about hip hop pioneer Rico Wade. Going to be checking in with my sister Natasha Love, great music insider. And we're going to be kicking off the conversation talking about what's going on with the Democratic National Convention. Now, folks, as we have these discussions, just know that you can check us out on our home platform of Black Star Network. Make sure you go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Download the app for free. Follow us on social media. And importantly, we ask that for your support. Your donation makes a world of difference for the work that we are embarked upon, making sure we're bringing Black digital content like never before. So your support means everything to us. So make sure you go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Now, we're also streaming on Amazon uh, platforms. So big shout out for Amazon News for putting us on their Amazon Fire TV. Also, you can find us on Amazon Prime Video. Just check us out on the Prime Video app under Live TV, the news. Or find us on Amazon.com under Prime Video, then Live TV, the news. We're also on the Freevee Network, where you can find us on now under news for the Freevee Network at Black Star Network, as well as Plex TV, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just search for Black Star Network or find us under Live TV, the news and opinion. And we're also streaming under Big Brother uh, excuse me, Roland Martin's uh, social media. You can find us streaming on his Facebook page. You can find us there as well as on his YouTube channel. And on all of those places, especially even with the X platform, you can find the great, illustrious culture crew. So big shout out to the online culture crew for always checking in, showing their support, and more importantly, making the conversations that we have so rich. So you could join us, folks. If this is your first time or 101st time, you can join the conversation. I would love to hear what you got to say. As I'm having conversations on air, you can have conversations on the chat. And then I bring you into the conversation on air by raising your thoughts, your questions, your comments as well. So it's a very interactive uh, show here that we have here on The Culture. And we truly appreciate your participation. All right, folks, let's kick it off. Let's first talk a little bit about what's going on in the uh, Democratic National Convention as they're preparing for their big convention that's going to be kicking off in about four months, folks in Chicago and people are already expecting there to be some divide, some division within the DNC. And now they're looking to prepare for it. Uh, let me to give you the latest. This is from Politico where party leaders are quick to point out, take a look at this folks, uh, where the party leaders are quick to point out that they are unified at a time when the RNC, the Republican National Convention has experienced upheaval, especially with the exit of Ronald McDaniel as party leader. But Democrats have a juggling act that they plan a convention. At the same time, protesters are working to get front and center access to the United Center. 
though the demonstrations over the Israel-Gaza war are unlikely to match those over Vietnam in 1968. Now, do you think that that's going to be a major concern for the DNC? I would love to get your take on this, Cruz. Share your thoughts, post your comments as we stream it live, of course, on Facebook and on YouTube. But it got me thinking, and which is why we wanted to bring this conversation to you, that the DNC is going into a spirit of uh, a time frame where there is some uncertainty, not necessarily about RNC, not even about President Trump, but there's still some uncertainty about whether this particular president, President Biden, can drive it home, can bring home, close the deal with voters, black voters, uh, LGBTQ voters, many other voters who feel like, you know what, the, D the Democratic Party may not be the answer. And so uh, I know that there are some concerns, not just in terms of these protests, which is major, because the DNC is expecting about 30,000 protesters to be gathering on the uh, uh, descending in Chicago um, for uh, to show their disappointment in the president. Now, this year's the, uh, Democratic Convention will be taking place at the United Center in McCormick Place in Chicago. And there are going to be uh, a number of hotels that have been already booked. They said about eight hotels is already booked. They're expecting a large um, number of folks to come through, a large number of delegates to come through. But that whole protest, those 30,000 potential protesters that may show up, and that's on the outside. There are still some level of people feeling like this Democratic Party is not speaking to their issues and concerns, and that's on the inside. So I want to kind of get your take on this, Cruz. Share your thoughts, post your comments. Should the DNC be concerned about the protests on the outside? And should they say, uh, should they be concerned about any type of, you know, division among the agenda, division about what the focus should be for the Democrats on the inside? Share your thoughts, post your comments. Look, I'm going to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's hear what you got to say. And let's stay tuned. We got a lot to cover this first half of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, and I hope and pray that all has been well with you, especially that you had a great weekend and that the start of your week is off to a good start. Uh, folks, we're kicking off the conversation talking about the DNC, how the Democratic National Convention is preparing uh, for another um, gathering in Chicago, and there are some concerns, logistic concerns, and just some agenda concerns about where the DNC or the Democratic Party stands on various issues. One of the big concerns is that there are going to be a large swath of protesters that are going to be on site when the DNC has their convention. Their convention is scheduled to be from um, August 19th through the 22nd. And based upon what the DNC has put out there, they are saying that they are working in collaboration with Chicago Police Department police department with federal officials to manage the protesters who expect you to converge on Chicago during that week, during that uh, time. And again, protest organizers expect as many as 30,000 demonstrators could come 
in August. And there are going to be some guidelines on how law enforcement handles this. Now, they say that this likens to the 1968 uh, convention because at that time, Vietnam War was, was the hot topic. And now, unlike the Israel-Gaza situation, and as we see now with Iran and and the latest the uh, latest drone attack from Iran into Israel, and how not just the United States but the whole world is telling Israel, please do not respond. The great concern that the president has at this point with this latest attack from Iran is that it's going to open up the door for a wider war. And so there is going to be a lot to consider um, to dealing with this larger situation across seas and more importantly, how it affects things over here. Now, that's one concern. The other concern that people are expecting is that, you know, policy agenda. What will the the, uh, the Democratic National Convention, how will they present themselves um, to their delegates, to their supporters, to those who have who are uh, filed as Democrats on their ballot, uh, on their voter registration cards and everything, how are they going to handle this? How are they going to bring it in? So the big word right now in the DNC is unity, staying unified, making sure that the DHC, DNC is showing a, a strong sense of support, that the DNC is ready to handle any issues, whether it's come from protesters, whether it's come from the uh, Republicans, or whether it's come from Donald Trump, that they are going to stand unified with their candidate, with their nominee, President Joe Biden, uh, moving forward in this uh, next part of the election. And I want to get your take on this, folks. What do you think, um, how you think the DNC should handle this situation? To dealing with these 30,000 potential protesters, they don't think it's going to be as large as what we saw with Vietnam protesters at the 1968 convention, but it still may be a significant number, enough number of folks that it's going to draw the attention. And of course, when you have your, your convention, you want to make sure that you, you keep everything tight. You keep your message tight. You keep the presenters of the speakers on, on, on hand, on task. You want to make sure that this thing goes off without too many issues or too many problems, because as we know, it's a presentation to the rest of this country and around the world as to how the DNC is going to move forward, what the DNC stands for, and more importantly, what is going to be the vision that's going to be laid out by the Democrats. So I would love to hear what you got to say as we stream a lot on Big Brother Roland Martin's uh, Facebook page, on his YouTube channel, and on the X platform. Now, there is, uh, I want to share with you very quickly what the DNC chair party Party Chair Mr. Jamie Harrison and Convention Chair Minyan Moore will be on hand. Uh, they talked about how they're going to plan to give some logistics for the convention, and they're going to make sure that they do their part. They're going to make sure that they do their part to make this an historic convention. And this is a great time. There is so much that the Democrats have to figure out. So much that they have to figure out, right? And it is going to be very, very important that the DNC get the message right. Um, I was thinking about even throwing this into the mix and talking a little bit more about it. For example, what happened with President Biden, how he spoke at the National Action Network. This is the organization that was uh, ran by uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, and how he spoke to them in New York over the weekend. And it's going to be interesting. And the president was defending his record. He's defending the strides and the progress of his administration in terms of speaking to the issues of black voters. Now, one of the big things he said during that uh, speech is that he's not going to stop working. He's not going to stop working for two issues, making sure the Voting Rights Act is reinstituted and also making sure that the Justice for Policing Act, the George Floyd bill, is, um, is get, comes across his desk. So he is still working on that. And I was reading a report saying that George Floyd's family said that they appreciate the president for not just making the trip to, to speak to black voters at the National Action Network, but they appreciate him still being on the job um, and, and still being uh, still pushing for that piece of legislation to happen. 
Uh, Tiana, you checked in. Thank you so much, Tiana. Welcome, 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 as always. And I see so many of you are in the chat right now, so I appreciate y'all. Tiana, you said, I hope it's not a repeat of the protests in the 60s. It might be 20,000 protesters at best. I hope so, too. I hope so, too. But you know what I'm thinking about, and as we've been having this conversation, and I know this could potentially change. And I appreciate you, Tiana. I thank you for so much for posting that. I think one of the things is making sure that it doesn't become a one issue situation. Y'all know what I mean, right? That yes, this stuff is important. This is very important, especially with this latest development with Iran and Israel and all of the drone attacks and the whole not. This is very, very important. So we're going to have to figure out, and I think this is the, the conundrum that the Democrats find themselves in, is that they're going to have to figure out how to make sure that you temper, like you, you, want, to, you want to address that, right? But you don't want it to be the only issue, right? And I think that to some degree, the president is starting to get it, that if you show too much closeness to Israel, if you are... If you create this situation or this place where in this relationship that the United States has with Israel that is completely unconditional support without any boundaries, without any guidelines. I was reading a report over the weekend how the president told, and they, as they say, I think this came out the Wall Street Journal, and they were say, making the point how Biden counsels Netanyahu to urge restraint in his response to the Iranian drones. So it's going to be, I think this president is starting to see like this could be a real problem. It could be a very real problem, especially if Israel shows that, you know what, now not only are we dealing with the situation in Gaza, now we got to deal with Iran and that can open up the door. Um, Deidre Hall, you check it in. Good to connect with you once again, Deidre. And I'm going to take a couple of more of you and then we're going to take a quick pause. Deidre, you said, this is confusing to me. What do the people want the president to do? It depends on who you are, Deidre. Some people say that you should be, he should be calling for a permanent ceasefire. We've been talking about that here. Some people are saying that, you know, as we heard of Vice President Harris, said she wants a few weeks for the end, of, for the stopping of the, uh, for at least some of the bombings and some of the, 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 the fighting there, because you gotta, you gotta get people time to get food and supplies and whatnot, right? There, has, um, there was a report that put out there that the White House said that the famine has already taken place in Gaza, famine. And so getting the resources, getting food and other resources to the people of Gaza during this time is critical. But if Israel is not willing to, 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 to address these humanitarian issues, once again, it's another big problem. So I think there are a couple of options on the table, Deidre, but the president has to be very firm about where he stands on this whole situation. Uh, let me see here. Rocky, 945, welcome to the chat. You said, riding with Biden. I hear you. You said, I hope this convention is peaceful and meaningful. We need new honest leaders to get Biden reelected so that this country can move forward instead of backwards. Amen, amen, amen. I love that. Yep, you're absolutely right, Rocky. New, honest leaders. Now, I don't know how honest is honest in politics in America, but if you're talking about 50, 60, maybe 70 percent honest, okay, I can take it. There's a compromise on the honesty, right? But if we, if I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're saying, because that is the point, right? Trying to get us into a new space with this and I'm going I'm to just say this, folks. I think over these next few months, we're going to see some wild stuff happening, you know, in terms of this election, um, some of these issues. And we already know the longstanding issues of voting and police reform and all of the education and health care. We already know about these. But when you're talking about this war, when you're talking about even dealing with the stuff with former President Donald Trump, he has his trial happening today, you know, uh, for that hush money scandal. When you're talking about these on these like new issues that have come up over the past few months, this is stuff that, you know, you really figure out whether, you know, how President Biden and his administration are going to handle it, like what they're going to do. But you got to make some firm decisions. You can't just kind of be wishy-washy. I know you agree with this on this one, Rocky. You can't be a wishy-washy president during a time that requires certainty. So we will have to see how this president moves. 
more importantly, we're going to have to see how the DNC responds to the protesters. And most importantly, I think it's important for us that that as constituents and as folks, if you are in the if you riding with Biden, like Rocky said, then make sure that you, you keep your eyes on how the, 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 uh, the DNC is moving forward. Let's keep our eyes on that. It's going to be super important. All right, look, I got to take a quick pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears. Let's talk about hip hop. Hip hop pioneer Rico Wade has passed away and has left an indelible impression on not just on hip hop music, but on the culture and the largest sound of Atlanta and Georgia. We're going to be checking in with music inside of Tasha Love to give us the latest around that and so much more. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Sun Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. State of the Union 2024, huge night for President Joe Biden. This was a CBS receipts type of night. Yes. He dragged the hell out of the Supreme Court. And he <laughs> said, y'all don't see the power of women. Trump's brain is melting as we speak. We want to organize from a place of strength. There's no confusion whatsoever about what they've done and what they plan to do. What Donald Trump is doing is presenting a fallacy. He is convincing them that he's all in it for them when in fact he's all in it for himself. We do not feel Joe Biden in spite of the success that have taken place during this administration economically. There are too many things where we do not feel like he's had our back. You should also be investing in the barbershops and the beauty salons and the hookah bars and the folks who are going to the club and there's a way to actually get them registered because we've done it before. But if you don't have folks who understand that dynamic, then you're missing a big opportunity. So we said we just celebrated. For what? Why did you go to Selma to celebrate rather than recommit yourself to the fight if the very thing we went to celebrate has been gutted? Republicans did not support a lot of the bills that were necessary to keep the country fluid. You can't only love your country when you win, right? Oh, no. You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? This was absolutely the knockdown drag out that we were really waiting Black for. voters are the base. They're the most important base of the Democratic Party. There was very few language in this speech at the time we see an attack on black history, an attack on DEI. The end of the BLM racial reckoning thing has come to a complete end because there was nothing in this speech for that. Our movement has never been grounded in two-party politics in this country. All of our movements ultimately get co-opted by a state that is anti-black. They called the old because they knew the way, and they called the young because they were strong. And I believe there is a good combination of that, but we can have ideas and we can have visions and dreams, but we have to have our young people also working beside us because they are strong, and they will run that race, and they will run it to the end. Activists, organizers, and young people have been pushing this administration to be on the right side of history and to do something about the issues that they care about. While the Ukraine the and Palestine are critical issues. They are not the only global issues. Not a single black person who should ever let it come out their mouth that I'm tired. Because there is somebody else who came before us who didn't stop fighting. folks welcome back to the culture here on the black star network i'm your host for roger muhammad thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the conversation all right folks let's switch gears let's talk about music let's talk about hip-hop culture and um you know we had we, we we suffered a loss over the weekend with a major major pioneer this brother who has created a sound of a, of a city and of a region that is no that is unlike any other sound. And I personally, 
I personally, when I heard the sounds of every from outcast to cool breeze to to all of the the sounds of organized noise and dungeon family, I fell in love. Absolutely fell in love. So to hear the passing of our brother Rico Wade was a big hit to the culture. But the beautiful thing is, is that even though he may have transitioned, it does not mean that he didn't leave a little bit of himself on the culture. So I wanted to check in and talk to my sister, Tasha Love, who is a music insider, to talk to us about the great, um, the great legacy of Rico Wade, because this brother, he, he, he redefined what it sounded like, what his house sounded like. And Tasha, you posted this on your Instagram, and I was like, never forget that classic line from Andre 3000 when he came to the award show years ago and said, all I'm going to say is the South got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought because to myself, it's true. absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Let's talk a little bit about Rico. Wait, what, what is it about Rico that really stuck out for you as a music insider? You worked it, you have been working in this industry for many, many years. How significant was this man? And more importantly, how much did he redefine what the culture sounded like, especially coming from the South? You know, I'm really, I'm so emotional because I knew him and his energy was absolutely electric and you believed everything that he told you that the South could do. Um, Rico Wade is one third of Organized Noise along with Sleepy Brown and Ray Murray and when I tell you that what they did for Atlanta um, and, and the Southern, I'm going to say Southern music um, in, in quotes because it really is worldwide Right? What they did for the South is what Dr. Dre did for L.A. It's what Diddy did for New York. I know it's taboo, but we still can't ignore his accolades. Um, but it really is what Rico and Organized Noise did for music worldwide is never to be forgotten. And, I, and I'm, I'm ever doubting it to be um, done again outside of DTP and So So Dev um, with Chaka Zulu and Jermaine Dupree. Um, Rico believed so deeply and wanted so bad um, to fight for Atlanta uh, in the in the hip hop music scene because, you know, uh, he grew up watching, you know, Fab Five Freddy being witness to what Wu-Tang did for New York. And he was like, I'm gunning, I'm gunning for that. I'm gunning to put Atlanta on the map. And so thankfully he had a mom <laughs> and I try to be that mom. Right, right. Would I try to be that mom where, you know, the mothers would allow the kids to come over to the house. But Rico did create the dungeon in his mom's basement. And that house uh, is currently on Airbnb. But that it is so significant what Rico did for the music industry. We really did lose an icon um, in Atlanta. But not only did he work just just put Outkast on the map, but he also co-wrote along with Sleepy and Ray um, Waterfalls, TLC's smash hit. But he did so much for the Dungeon family. I'm talking about Goody Mob. I, I was oh, in yeah. school. Goody Come Mob on. sat behind me in class. Oh. Like, <laughs> we were in class with Morris Brown together. Um, but that's crazy, the, Tasha. The history. I'm so proud to have come from New York to Atlanta to have this experience and being here when Rico um, created this huge movement. I'm talking Janelle Monet, Goody Mob, Outkast, Sleepy Brown. What he did for, for Southern music is, is, is transcending. You know, I just, I just imagine heaven is having a party with left eye. Like that, that's really what I believe. That is awesome. Look, we're going to take another pause when we come forward. Let's continue to talk about Rico Wade and the sound of the South with my sister, music inside Tasha Love. Folks, stay with us. Post your comments, share your thoughts. I saw some of you already saying something, little something, something. Shauna, Shauna, my sister Shauna Marsh, you checked in. You were like talking. You made it. You said, uh, what you say here, Shauna, very quickly. You, you, I think you mentioned organized noise was a movement. Absolutely. And I'm from the East Coast. But when I heard <laughs> that, that sound, I was like, oh, yeah, the South got something to say. Folks, let's continue to talk about the great Rico Wade and, and the impact on of Southern hip hop here on The Culture on the Black Star Network.
need you to scream for your new beginning. Five, four, three, two. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host for Roger Muhammad, joined by my sister, music insider, Tasha Love, as we're talking about the great legacy of Rico Wade, who is hip-hop pioneer. He was part of the Organized Noise Dungeon and Dungeon family, a major, major movement, music movement, cultural movement that was uh, kicked off in the 90s. And like I said, Tasha, when I first heard Outkast, my uncle put me, my uncle who lived in Chicago, Chicago, of course, is like a southern northern city. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, my uncle put me on and he's from Chicago and he put me on to Outcast, and he put me on to like Cool Breeze and Dungeon Family, Organized Stories. And this was in the late 90s. Uh -huh. And I, when I heard that, I was just, I mean, the euphemisms, the drawl, the accent, but the they, the, I mean, it was it was a sound that was unmatched. And, and me being from Baltimore, highly, uh, heavily influenced from New York City, you know what I'm saying? Like, you heard that sound. But then when I heard Outkast, I was like, who in the world is yeah. this? And they, they, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, you know, I'll never forget this line from Nas. He was like, you know, the, I forgot which song he talks about. You know, we often have to believe that Southern dudes are slow. He says Southern N-words ain't slow, right? Like, just because you talk a certain way doesn't mean that you don't have intelligence. Right. And and I think that what, what he did, Rico Wade did, in terms of taking the music, he wasn't trying to make it sound like New York. He wasn't trying to make it sound like L.A. No. He gave us a sound that was so Southern and yet it had this funk. You know, it made me think of George Clinton, the great George Clinton. Right. It still it still had this this like very grassroots Southern feel. You know, we talk about Beyonce and how her music uh, with his latest album is that comes from the South. Rico, you make you feel like you're in them cornfields, man. You, you know what I'm saying? But you rap, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you rap it. You, you, you saying something. And more importantly, it was Goody Mob that I remember, Soul Food, that album right there. Yes. I was like, that's a that was a whole movement. I think that dropped in, what, 96? Because I was on the Fugees in 95, 96, and then I heard <laughs> Goody Mob. You know what I'm saying? That's, that, was, that was the... That was that was the options that we had in the mid to late nineties. Yeah, we had those options that you got a little bit of New York. You had the Goody Mobs, and, and you had you had Dre and and Snoop. Right, that was that was jumping in a, in the mid to late nineties. And then yeah. you had Outkast. You did have Dunder Family. You had Cool Breeze. You had all these sounds, and it was like a buffet of just 
music artistry like no other. It was like no other. But I wanted to know, and since you did know Rico, like how did he see his sound? How did oh he see God. about his legacy and how, the groundwork that he was laying? Listen, he believed to the point where you eat, sleep, breathe it. It's pumping through your veins. He would come into my office literally with CDs in hand, like Tasha, I got the next, I got the next, I got the next joint. Um, and I'm, you know, I sat back and I really reflected this week as to where I came from in hip hop, and I'm so blessed that. I come from New York and then I came down here to down south um, because, you know, we also lost Mr. C and I, I and I hope we get the opportunity oh, to talk right. about him as well. But literally, Mr. C passed on my birthday. Rico passed uh, a day later. Like I was my energy was just all over the place this weekend. But uh, Rico would literally walk into my office fresh out of the studio from cutting a new whether it be outcast, you know, Monet or anything dungeon family he would come in just on a humble by himself no no bodyguards no pretentiousness like he would just walk in and be like yo tosh i got this record i want you to hear let me know your thoughts i would take it i dj greg street is an icon in in, in southern music and um i really want to give him a lot of credit because um dungeon family is atlanta Rico Wade's vision, along with Sleepy and Ray, was to do what um, Wu-Tang did for New York, what Dre did for L.A. Right. He really said he would go to parties. And, and we party. Now, let me tell you this. We party in Atlanta. I, I, I okay? can tell you party uh, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, you, 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 I ain't talking about me partying online in front of nobody. <laughs> I, I have no conversation. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that without Rico, there would be no Outcast, there would be no Sleepy Brown, there would not be on the level of Janelle Monet. Like we would have had these alternate universes where, of course, they may have made it. But you have to understand the creativity that Rico brought to the game. It, it, it's not, it's not just a tagline. Like he really did eat, sleep, breathe Atlanta. He and he brought that forth in his music, music without question, without hesitation. Um, he really went to the forefront. He knocked on the doors. Um, L.A. Reid um, uh, talks about how Pebbles brought him to um, to LaFace. And Pebbles was like, look, I got this group. You know, I know this guy. He's a great producer. L.A. met him. Um, Pebbles got another group that she was interested in. But L.A. got outcast. When I tell you how hard he fought for Outkast and when he said the South has something to say, he meant that. They dreamt it. They slept on the floor of his mother's basement until they changed the sound. They put Atlanta on the map, opening the door for your DTP, for uh, your so-so death. It, it really is. It, it, to be alive in Atlanta during the 90s, early That's 90s, when, when Dungeon Family was on deck. That's real it, talk. It, I it can only imagine. Person. Hey, look, I was, again, I'm in Baltimore. I'm like, damn. Yeah. Damn, like, oh, they, they keep doing no it up. There was no picnic without Dungeon Family. <laughs> and look, 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 there was, not only was there a sound, there was a consciousness there, yeah. right? Yeah. There was a consciousness there. Like, all of, even though, like, I'm telling y'all, like, when I listen to Southern, like, when you talk about Southern hip hop, quote, unquote, that consciousness was there. They weren't talking about just, the, the way that a lot of those rappers talked about street life, hard living, that growing yeah. up and all of that stuff, there was, there was a lesson to those stories. And it wasn't just like glorification. It was like, nah, we had to do this because, and then they go into that person, you know, these artists would go into their personal history about their families and the, all of these things. But there was a consciousness there which I appreciated, right? That's what made Goody Mob and Outkast and all of yeah. these artists, that's what made them stand out. Because yeah, they could talk about, they could talk about the street stuff, but they they really were like, man, look, this is our condition. And I love that very quickly before we take our next pause. Let me do this, let me take another quick pause very quick. But I wanna get your take, Tasha, on how do we need to get back to regional hip hop, Shana, one of our mm -hmm. culture crew members talked, talked about this, saying that you know she remembers those times of being in, in, in Bermuda in the 90s, but she fell in love with regional hip hop. And I'm wondering, is right. that what's missing from the culture today? 
where you did have each region had its own flavor, its own sound, its own culture. I'm going to get your take on that. So stay with it, folks. We're continuing the conversation on the other side with Tasha Love, Music Insider, and of course with you. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by my sister. Man, she always brings something good to the conversation. She's a music insider. She's one of our great contributors here on the show. My sister Tasha Love talking about the passing and the life and legacy of Brother Rico Wade, one of the great pioneers of the Southern sound. Um, he passed away last week, and there has been a ton of outpouring of support for him and his family, and our condolences go to him and his family to his family during this time. But this man redefined the sound of the South, and he put, as you said, Tasha, he put Atlanta on a map. But I'm wondering, do we need to get back to that place in hip hop? You've been doing this for a long time. You've heard all of the iterations, the ebbs and flows, the valleys and the peaks. You've been through this all. Do we need to get back to a place where, like we experienced in the 90s and in the 2000s, there are two things on that very quickly. I remember I, I was listening to, I've been listening to the Fuji's The Score. Uh, oh, that Classic. Let's not, let's not even talk about that. But then I've thought about the time period in which that dropped, like 90, I want to say 96. Yeah. It dropped in 96. And what was the offerings, the hip hop offerings at that time, yeah. right? So you had you had choices. Then I reflected on what Nelly said in a recent conversation. I think he was on LeBron's show. But he was saying that when he came into the industry in the late 90s, he said, I was in competition with a Jay-Z, a Eminem, a Ludacris. Right. I was, I mean, and then of course on that, on the on you had that level, but then on the the emerging culture from that time, you had Gucci Mane. Um Boop, Jeezy. You had all them guys, right? You had that sound, which right. is in Jeezy. You had that sound that really came out of like Atlanta, out of yeah. Georgia. You know what I'm saying? So, so do we think you do you think we need to get back to that regional place? Is that something that you see the industry going to, especially now that you see more artists are saying, you know what, I'm gonna put out music on my own. You see more artists who are trying who are who are taking control and, and of their own musical destiny and fate what, what's your take on it oh gosh i'm trying to contain my thoughts because i'm so glad <laughs> like i'm just trying to stay focused right now um listen the thing that really made rico stand out was that he didn't stunt the creativity of his artist if andre wanted to put on a blonde wig if andre wanted to play a flute 
if Andre wanted to be there on the cover with no shirt on, but then you had um, Big Boy in a in a ATL jersey, then he allowed the creativity and the music to happen. The problem with the industry right now, as far as the music industry is concerned, is that it's really cookie cutter. They're looking for the yeah. next trick that's gonna go shake her ass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yep. Um, and because it sells records, right? You know, we talk about Sexy Red, we talk about Megan Thee Stallion, and I'm not hating on them at all. You know, certainly if I would, if, if my knees were still good, I might, I might do a little something uh, where I could get low. Don't do that to your knees, Tasha. Huh? Don't do that to your knees. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, <laughs> refocusing and getting back on topic. <clears throat> the industry is about making money. And people have a tendency to forget that. It's not whether or not we like the song, but it's what's moving weight in units. And, you know, if our 16 year olds are, are buying music at a higher rate than let's say my demographic or 18 to 34, then what that's gonna do is it's gonna drive the album sales. It's gonna push the music, um, the music units. And that's what they're looking for. Music is, uh, radio is an industry that is somewhat archaic, um, especially to ra terrestrial radio where you get in your car and you listen just to yeah, the, try to true. find the station. Now you have satellite. You can YouTube from your phone um, and stream it back into your car. Me personally, I have a big block. Of, I got a CD book um, that I still rummage through because those to me are the classics. Irv Gotti, uh, Rico Wade, you know, um, Diddy even, uh, Aaliyah, you know, uh, minus the R. Kelly part. But what I'm saying is, is that I still go back to what I grew up with um, in college, which is Ludacris and DTP and, you know, everybody coming out of that camp. So really um, for me moving moving from New York to Georgia, I still grew up with where Brooklyn at. I'm not from Brooklyn. I'm from Westchester. But you best believe that. that, that, that you best believe I mean, that could have been a great hook, whatever. though, Tasha. Listen, it could have been listen, like, listen. where Westchester at? Where Westchester? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it all day. But, but what I'm saying is, whatever Kiss played, uh, whatever BLS played, from Mr. C to um, Wendy Williams to on down, to Funk Master Flex, you know, that's what I grew up with. That's what I was fed and that's what I was raised on. So I agree when your um, your viewer said, should we go back regional? Yeah. I, and I I think that's what we need. I need. I think we need that friendly competition to where, whether it be, and when I say friendly, I mean friendly, um, but at the same time, um, there's so much going on in hip hop right now. Just like I said to you last week, Drake versus everybody. Now everybody dropping disc records on Drake. But what we really need to do is recognize the creativity that came from both Rico Wade and Mr. C. Yeah. And Rico really did focus in on live instrumental samples, Curtis Mayfield, Sleepy yep. Brown. Oh, yeah, um, yep, yep, yep. You know, they... Because they he's from that time. I mean, he, he, Rico was still yeah. a young man. You know, he, yeah. he passed away. Uh, I think he was 52, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Tyler? Listen, born the same year. He is He is 52. He was 52. 52. Yes. So, so you know, and, 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 and oddly enough, people, you know, I think, I think this part of the conversation or this narrative around hip-hop being a young man's thing, I don't think that's true. I think now... I agree. You do have a lot more artists that are older. You know what I'm saying? Now, are they producing music the way they did? No, not they may not be putting an album every two years, and that they're not going to be streaming. But when they do come out and say something, I saw this. I saw this Big Daddy Kane uh, yeah. video on. I did you see that when he was rapping? And yeah. people are like, "Whoa, Big Daddy Kane! He, he's been that guy. He's that's him. He, he him. Like, he him." And I'm like, like talking about LL. It's like talking about LL, Big Daddy Kane, Salt and Pepper. Like they're an era of hip hop that we're not seeing come up right now. It really right. is future. It really is little Uzi. It, I mean, it's just artists that our demographic just can't appeal to. You know what I'm saying? Like I personally am introducing my son to these things because these are actual samples um, that he and I can enjoy together. I don't get. I don't get what um, the. I want to say millennial. I'm trying. Listen, I'm trying. Okay. Are you trying? Are you really trying, Tasha? Are you really trying? <laughs> I look, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, if you don't listen to radio, you are going to be out of the loop. Facts. And, and that's what you, and I think that's the value of terrestrial radio is that yeah. you can put your, you can kind of knock yourself out the box because if you always listen to right. your curated playlist, <laughs> Or if, you know what I'm saying? You probably, you of course you won't say, oh, who are these new artists? 
You're not right. listening to terrestrial radio that's built on popularity, ratings, revenue. So they always have to keep up. Just turn on the radio wherever you right. are and then just listen to it for a little bit on the drive and you will get a sense of, oh, this is the latest artist. Oh, this is who the people are talking about. But if you are consumed, and I get it, and it's very easy, not to say it's your fault, but folks' fault, but if you listen to terrestrial radio, that's the value that you you will, you will still hear some of the fresh voices, the new voices. And I think, and I know we can't get into it because we just don't have time today, Tasha, but right, they, right. all these new voices doesn't mean that they're bad. They're just different. No, it doesn't. It just means that it's not something that we grew up with. Like Biggie sampled the Mary Jane girls. We can relate to our parents because, you know, because of the Mary Jane girls sample. Like we can relate to these, but there's just certain records now that we just, that they're yeah. not in our demographic. My son might recognize it. I don't. He's 10. I'm not. So, but, but, but in no means am I demeaning that. But what I am saying is that there's a larger conversation about how these artists have evolved when they weren't even supposed to be here. Again, Back. without Mr. C, there would be no Biggie. Without um, without uh, um, Rico Wade, there would be no Outkast. There would be no Sleepy Brown. There would be no Janelle Monet. Like we really, re there would be no Goody Mob. We need to look at how hip hop, the pioneers, when we say the pioneers, are, the pioneers of hip hop, we're talking about the producers. We're talking about the music makers. We're not talking about the artists themselves. We're talking about the That's visionaries right. that saw the point. talent from point. these artists and we need to recognize that. That's an excellent point. Cause you can't have one without the other. It's like having a, no. you can't say I'm a dope MC and you don't have no DJ. You got a whack DJ. <laughs> you got a whack DJ. He just, he's not right. even breaking a record. He's not even putting the record right. on. He, right. No, but you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Tasha, I appreciate you sis, as always. As it, you know, we're having these conversations every week. So somewhere in the mix, I got to throw you somewhere in the mix. I appreciate you know, it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But no, I appreciate that. And and I know that there's going to be so much. Continue to put stuff out there for, for folks to, to check out. Real quick, before we take our next pause, what's your social? You can reach me at On Air with Tasha Love on uh, Instagram. And you could also find me at Tasha Love Style on uh, the X platform. There it is right there. Tasha Love, Music Insider, one of our great new contributors here on The Culture. And I'm very, very happy my sister's able to check in with me and talk about the life and legacy and the sound of Rico Wade in the South. Thank you, Tasha, for being so good for the culture. Thank you. There's the A. There it is. There's the A. There's the A. All right, folks, we got to take another quick pause when we come forward. Let's get, let's get into a conversation about our health and wellness and check in with our very own Dr. Bridget. Stay with us. It's The Culture here on the Black Star Network. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. This is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues. Y'all better understand something real quick. We ain't going nowhere. It is a continual battle that we see all uh, across this country. Revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be streamed. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. He makes sure that our stories are told. Roland Martin's doing this every day. You can't be black on media and be scared. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you.
All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show and being a part of the conversation. Folks, uh, we are very excited. Um, had a fantastic first half of the show where we checked and talked a little bit about what's going on at the DNC. And we did our show of uh, just a little bit of our honor and respect for the great Rico Wade as I checked in with music inside Natasha Love. Folks, if you enjoy the conversation that we have, whether it's today or yesterday or, or, or over the past week and everything, if this is your first time or if this is your 30th time, whenever the time you, you spent watching the show, we truly appreciate your support. So just go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Download the app for free here and um, follow us on social media at Black Star Network. But of course, folks, your donations, your support makes a world of difference for us here at Black Star Network. So anything you can offer, anything you can give, anything you can contribute is certainly, certainly appreciated. So let's go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com. Also, make sure you follow us, excuse me, at uh, Black Star Network. Follow Big Brother Roland Martin at Roland Martin on all social media platforms, as well as me, yours truly, Faraji Muhammad. You can follow me at The Real Faraji on Instagram and at Faraji on the X platform, and I would love to connect with you. Now, we're also streaming on Amazon platforms. You can find us on Amazon News or on your Fire TV. You can also find us on Amazon Prime Video. So make sure you go to the Prime Video app and, and check us out there under Live TV The News or Amazon.com under Prime Video Live TV The News. You can also find us on Freevee Network. So big shout out to Freevee as we're on now under News and Plex TV, 24 hours a day, seven days. So we just search for Black Star Network on Plex TV. All right, folks, it is Monday. It is time for us to check in to get us a little, get our week started as we talk about health and wellness. It's now time for us to reclaim our wellness with Dr. Bridget Cole Williams. Let's check her out. Dr. Bridget, good afternoon. How are you feeling today? Pretty good. How are you, Faraji? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Doc. I'm doing well. Uh, thank you so much, as always. You got a lot to talk about. You got some stuff to yep. talk about today. Absolutely. So there's definitely some things that are going on. And I think uh, just picking up from where we left off, we got to talk about these cicadas that are coming. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. I saw something, Doc. I mean, look, because you put that seed in my thinking, in my brain the last time talking about some damn cicadas and i was like ah oh, yeah yeah i'm familiar next thing you know i'm reading about it it sounds like this thing is going to be an attack i'm i'm not even joking folks if you are haven't heard there are going to be a high number of cicadas that's yeah. going to be infecting the united states over the next couple of months they're talking about the broad i don't even know they got different categorizations for the cicadas uh the cicada uh it, what do you call that? Is it like a takeover? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to scare people, right? right? I don't want to get them nervous. At the end of the day, they do not cause any harms to humans whatsoever, okay? And in there are certain areas of the world where people actually eat these little creatures. We're not talking about that, Doc. Hey, Doc, we're talking about health and wellness. That's health and wellness. It's a surplus of Man, nobody protein. Looks, looks. I'm from the hood. <laughs> All right. We're not, we not picking up some cicadas and like, no. hey, hey, you want some rice with that? Like, I have actually have heard that people do eat them, but yes. it is interesting. Now, this is, they're saying this spring where this infestation of cicadas are going to take place, trillions, <laughs> this is the actual number of crew, Trillions right. of cicadas will emerge from the ground in multiple states, part of a rare double double broad broad event that has happened that hasn't happened in over two hundred years. Trillions. Yeah. yeah, the last time this happened was in eighteen o three, and the significance of it is that there's more than one brood. Is that uh, what he said? Is it called brood? I call it a brood, brood, but you know, I'm not the one to, uh, as far as the pronunciation there, but I call it a brood. Yes. Right. Right. And there are the, the, the true difference is that it is rare for more than one brood to come out of the ground at the same time 
because they're on, some broods are in a cycle of every 13 years, other ones are in a cycle of every 17 years, at some point or another, they're both going to kind of catch up with each other. And the areas in the country where you see them, there's some certain areas where both of them are going to happen at the same time. And that's where those numbers really multiply. Um, and that they're looking at central Illinois being a big, big part of this. So it is a very unique phenomenon that's happening right now. Um, we won't see it probably again for another 200 and some years, uh, but it's something to experience. And, um, you know, originally they were saying that we were going to see this at the same time as the eclipse, but this typically happens uh, in May. So, so, so this typically happens in May. You, we just had a total eclipse that just happened a few days ago. Mm -hmm. And um, what does this mean? Is this significant in any way that we're seeing all of these things happening? And I, I, I know that there are, there are some, some biblical scholars out there that say this is the end times, but is this just a part of Mother Nature's rejuvenation, regeneration process? Like, what are we seeing here? I think it's just math at the end of the day on this one, that yeah. it's just how these numbers line up. And at some point or another, they're going to connect. They're going to um, show themselves at around the same time. Now, I know a question that I had, and I know other people have said that because it's that sound that you hear at night, people often think that they're crickets and they're actually cicadas. And the, the difference is that there are periodic cicadas, which is what we're talking about, and there are actually annual cicadas, right? And they usually come out in June. So in the heat of the summer, you hear that sound in the trees and what have you. There are annual broods and then there are periodic broods. And so these periodic broods can really overwhelm the area. And if you're interested in seeing that, you know, um, different broods will show up in different places, but they do collide um, in central Illinois. There it is. Look, we're going to take a quick pause. When we when we come back, let's continue to talk to Dr. Bridget. And she wanted to bring us up to speed on this infestation of trillions of cicadas. She also <laughs> want to talk to, to us a little bit about this bias testing around kidney transplant and so much more. We got a lot to talk about in today's uh, segment of Reclaim Your Wellness with Dr. Bridget. So stick around. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us this is an opportunity for us to be able to speak to our issues y'all better understand something real quick we ain't going nowhere it is a continual battle that we see all of, uh, across this country revolution will not be televised the revolution will be streamed all momentum we have now we have to keep this going he makes sure that our stories are told roland mark's doing this every day you can't be black on media and be scared All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Farajji Muhammad, joined by my sister, Dr. Bridget, for this week's Reclaim Your Wellness as we talk about the uh, cicadas are coming. They are coming, folks, and they're going to be uh, making their way 
to uh, emerging from the ground starting this spring. And I just saw this, this little piece in USA Today, Dr. Bridget, where they said that the roots will begin to emerge when the soil eight inches underground reaches 64 degrees and are often triggered by a warm rain, they will likely emerge beginning in mid-May and last through late June. Mm -hmm. so right. You're talking about eight inches underground soil when, when the soil is eight inches underground reaching 64 degrees triggered by some warm rain. They're talking about um, the bruise will be found in 14 states across the southeast and Midwest and mm -hmm. brood and I, they have different brood numbers. So you have like brood 13 mm -hmm. will be in the Midwest. Um, and and this is going to be a major, major infestation. More importantly, though, you said this in the beginning of your remarks that they don't cause they don't they're not harmful to us. But yeah. so they don't carry no disease because I want you to kind of dead all of the the myths, the, the myths about cicadas. They don't carry disease. They right. are they 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 don't bite you, right? These what, what other things that we should be mindful of about cicadas? I think just the pure size and abundance can be really overwhelming for us when we see them. But the fact of the matter is, cicadas typically uh, live underground, and they actually. Um, feed off of the roots of trees. And so every 13 to 17 years, they emerge, as you were sharing, from the ground, go into the trees for mating. So that time period in May, in, from May to June, is their breeding time, which was what all the, the ruckus and noise is about. And then after they actually um, have the new cicada that is dropped from the trees, those new cicada go into the ground and then they begin the cycle again. And so really they come out of the earth simply for mating purposes. And then, like I said, whether it's, you know, I think there's seven or eight different broods, depending on the brood, depends on the cycle, whether it's a 13 or 17 year cycle. That, that is interesting. And then there's still annual ones. So, because people do get confused about that. There are ones that don't, don't behave exactly the same way and they come out every July. What is the, uh, is there any particular guidance that say the CDC or any other public health institution is, um, will, will be offering any recommendations on how to deal with them? Because when I was growing up and we had cicadas, I mean, they would just be any and everywhere. Some people would sweep them up. Some people would, you know, smash them. What was the best way to handle them once you physically see them? I mean, sweeping them up isn't a bad idea. The fact of the matter is that after they mate, they end up dying. So if you're walking and wondering why are all these, for the most part, dead carcasses all over the ground, it's because of that. And so it, it's, the, it's their life cycle, to be honest. And so to sweep them up is a fine way to get rid of them. You know, destroying them or stepping on them probably isn't necessary or feeling intimidated by them and trying to kill them isn't necessary either. I'm sure if they somehow get into your home, that's no, they're not any more happy about it than you are. Um, so nice. trying to get them out is probably the best idea, but most of the time they stick to the trees. Well, you know what, and what, what would you say for children? Any special guidance or recommendations for children? Cause I know what I did when, when, when he came as a child. I pick them up and start examining them. I used to be that kid. You know what I mean, Doc? Well, you know, I will say well, for I was, people, I was, I'm the only one that picked up cicadas now. Yes. Well, I definitely didn't. I definitely didn't. <laughs> but I will say that if you're a bug enthusiast, this is a very exciting time. And you'll people that are very much into bugs and studying them will be making pilgrimages to these areas so that they can learn more about them. But to be, I told my daughters to, if they're gonna be out and about and it bothers them, get an umbrella. That get. A, hey, can you imagine just going on a date night with an umbrella? Yeah. <laughs> Baby, you got That's something in your hair. What the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gra but, yeah. <laughs> grab an umbrella. That, that, that's, that sounds good. That sounds good. Well, at least we know that they don't carry any type of disease or anything. And, and just in terms of our own health and wellness, they're not a risk. They're not a risk to us. It's just it's just an annoyance if, if that's the problem. It's, it's, more of it's an, an annoyance. annoyance. But, but they do have a nutty shrimp flavor if that's what you're looking for. 
right. We, we, yeah. We can move on. Wait a minute, time so. out. Well, hang on. Can I ask you a question? I mean. No, I have never. I, I have never. I've never. Uh, I've never how eaten How do one. you know what the flavor is, Doc? No, I've never eaten one. I read. So somebody actually said, hey, man, cicadas. I'm surprised somebody didn't say, hey, cicadas taste like chicken. Tastes like shrimp. It tastes like shrimp. That's what that's that's what the report said. But come on. You you know I you come on. You know I didn't. You know I didn't. <laughs> okay. Another well, for someone that might just, this is this is information. We're here to share information. That's all we're doing. All right, look, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna just take it like that, take it by your word. If you want a nutty, shrimpy cinnamon flavor in your food, by all means, that's totally up to you. Doc, we gotta take another quick pause. When we come back, let's talk about something even more serious. Let's talk about bias testing for kidney transplant and so much more. Stay with us, folks. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to the culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Thank you so much for checking in. We are joined by our sister, Dr. Bridget Cole Williams, to talk to us a little bit about health and wellness for this week's uh, Reclaim Your Wellness. All right, Doc, let's talk about some other things that are happening on the health front. You talked to, I know you mentioned to me, um, and we chatted a little bit about this, but uh, talking about the situation of bias testing. What, what, what is this all about, especially when it comes to the kidney transplant? Absolutely. So this is an interesting time because this goes, we're talking about kidney transplant, but this goes way beyond that as well. So right now there are 14,000 um, black kidney transplant candidates that are being given credit for wasted time. So basically these 14,000 individuals um, have been on a wait list to receive a kidney transplant. And because of a test that is racially biased, saying that actually their kidney function was better than what it was based on their race, um, in which case they're, they have had to wait to get on that list to get the tr kidney transplant. All that's being changed by the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology to actually remove the racial bias that says that uh, as far as black people and as far as how well their kidneys are functioning. And so these individuals have actually been moved up in the wait list because they were not added when they adequately should have been added to receive a kidney. Doc, how come this is always the problem? Like, like you know, when we talk about healthcare in this country, and it's, it's been, I mean, we're in 2024 and we're still challenged by policies that just consider our race, not even consider our health, our wellness, our well being, but where race plays such a major role in whether we get seen by a doctor or more importantly, whether we get any type of real treatment, that race is still a big factor in this thing. Why is that? I mean, and it's sad that that we're, we we have to fight to even be seen by a doctor. We have to fight to even be diagnosed. We have to fight to be treated. What what is going on? Well, in this case, the the test that we're talking about is the estimated um, glomerular filtration rate, and what they found in doing some studies in 1999 that they thought there was a difference between how black people kidneys function versus white people's kidney function. Keep in mind, there really just weren't enough black people in the study to be able to make um, an appropriate uh, conclusion. 
But regardless, they it was seen as that you know, black people and their kidneys function differently. And so there was a change in this equation to make up for the fact that our kidneys function a little bit differently. In reality, that's not really true. And so what's exciting about this is that not only are they taking these people, they're giving credit for this time, they're moving them up on the list. So far, 208 people have received their kidneys the way that they should, um, moving them up higher in the list. But other aspects of the medical community are looking at this as well. Um, there's been a race, racial bias as far as with obstetrics and the risk of a pregnant woman attempting vaginal verse prior to um, how long she has to try a vaginal birth um, as opposed to having a C-section. There was a racial bias in that. Uh, the American Heart Association also found um, they're removing the racial component when they look at even heart disease. And the American uh, Thoracic Society is also removing race as a part of how they look at lung function. And so this is not only something that's going to affect so many people um, as far as kidneys, because despite that, 30% of Black people have some form of kidney failure on the list of the there's like 89,000 people waiting, 30% of them are black, but it will mean that maybe we're going, things might be changing somewhat, that they might be looking back at their research and realizing the flaws that this research yeah. caused. Uh, let me go to one of the crew members, Nicole Smith. Nicole, you posted something and I appreciate you, Nicole, for posting this question. You said, uh, can Dr. Bridges speak on the transplant program in Houston that's been temporarily stopped due to a doctor's misconduct? Are you familiar with that situation, Doc? I am not. So I can definitely look into that. But uh, okay. the transplant program? Um, yeah. No, I have and, and Nicole, if you can, um, mm -hmm. if you can talk to us, uh, give us some more details about that. That way Doc can uh, at least, you know, take a look at that and then address it. But when you do have doctor's misconduct, does that... I mean, is that something that could potentially stop a whole program from happening? Well, I can only assume, and like I said, I'll have to take a look here, that maybe there yeah. was some bias or, you know, misconduct can mean a thousand different things, right? Yeah. And yeah, so um, to take another look at this, you know, the fact of the matter is when there is something that has gone wrong, when people have been um, not treated fairly or given some sort of harm has caused, it's going to shut a program down um, simply because they have to kind of wipe the slate clean, do an investigation and try to get back on track. So th that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just a horrible inconvenience. And hopefully it doesn't cause um, any loss of life in the in the course of this. Absolutely. Um, Nicole also says she saw the black man on TV that received the pig, the pig's kidney. You know, I will tell you what we're doing now with transplant is, you know, because right now, I don't know if people really think about this, but when we're talking about any transplant program, it means that someone that has to die, whether it's by ac um, in an accident or organs being donated for you to receive that organ. And so any attempt to try to find ways and that's why the list is so long, because not only does someone have to die, but there also has to be a match so that you can actually accept that new organ. So right. anytime there is any possibility of mitigating that and being able to do this in another way so that we can keep people alive longer, it might sound odd for uh, a pig organ, but you know sometimes these people end up dying before they ever get considered. Uh, for and that's the, the other part about it. I mean, that's the yeah. that's the other part about it. I mean, I know in the in the in the report that came from Associated Press, they made the state. It, it was said numerous formulas or algorithms used in medical decisions around treatment guidelines, diagnostic tests, risk calculators adjust the answers according to race or ethnicity in a way that puts people of color at a disadvantage. And that's what we're seeing. That thousands of Black patients have had their uh, wait times modified by an average of two years. And I mean, if you're yeah. in need of a kidney 
and you're on the wait list for at least two years, I mean, the likelihood is that you're, you, you, you may not make it in that, Absolutely. In that, time, frame, in that time frame. So how is, how is the industry, the medical industry responding to this? Because there's still, it's very slow. It, 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 the healthcare industry reminds me of government, slow to make the decision, quick to, 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 to really, um, to shut something down. So Absolutely. it's like, how do you change that algorithm? Is it because of uh, doctors like yourself got to be advocates? Do, do, do black people have to become patients where we're speaking out? How, how does those algorithms change? Well, I will tell you, being um, an advocate for yourself definitely will help. I was looking at some blood work of a patient of mine just the other day. It had the estimated um, GFR. Um, it also had the estimated GFR um, if black. Okay. The difference is, is that not only, and, and to be honest, my entire, well, a great deal of my career, both of those numbers were there. Okay. What we need to do is get our, the physician to remove that out of their um, interpretation and actually mm -hmm. use the, e, the, the GFR number that is for everyone. And so what I actually recommend to people is to be your own advocate. And when you're reviewing your lab work with your yeah. practitioner, may, you know, ask them, how are you looking at my kidney function? Are you looking at the race-based number or are you looking at the general number? Because I'm going to say most of the time, they would, both numbers are always on there. It's just which one are you utilizing to consider? And using the one for Black patients will not help you. It will actually... Um, give make your kidney function look better than what it is, and if you have a problem, you need to be treated. So you got to, and, and, and I, we got to take another quick pause. But you, you, you're saying that as patients, we have to be not just knowledgeable, but we have to be more vocal about uh, making sure vocal. that we get the correct information, and and to say to our doctors or to our healthcare physicians, like, hey, I need the real numbers. Don't look at based upon my race. I need the numbers based upon my condition. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm? And there's usually that? about a 16 percent difference um, between those two numbers. So it I is do. important. Yeah, it's it's important to have that conversation. Wow, 16 percent difference, folks. We got to mm -hmm. take another quick pause when we come forward. Let's continue the conversation with Dr. Bridget and you. It's for uh, as we continue our, our segment, reclaim your wellness here on the Culture on the Black Sun Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. Game on. State of the Union 2024. Huge night for President Joe Biden. This was a CBS receipts type of night. Yes. He dragged the hell out of the Supreme Court. And he said, <laughs> y'all don't see the power of women. Trump's brain is melting as we speak. We want to organize from a place of strength. There's no confusion whatsoever about what they've done and what they plan to do. What Donald Trump is doing is presenting a fallacy. He is convincing them that he's all in it for them when in fact he's all in it for himself. We do not feel Joe Biden in spite of the success that have taken place during this administration economically. There are too many things where we do not feel like he's had our back. You should also be investing in the barbershops and the beauty salons and the hookah bars and the folks who are going to the club and there's a way to actually get them registered because we've done it before. But if you don't have folks who understand that dynamic, then you're missing a big opportunity. So we said we just celebrated. For what? Why did you go to Selma to celebrate rather than recommit yourself to the fight if the very thing we went to celebrate has been gutted? Republicans did not support a lot of the bills that were necessary to keep the country fluid. You can't only love your country when you win, right? Oh, no. 
You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? This was absolutely the knockdown drag out that we were really waiting for. Black voters are the base. They're the most important base of the Democratic Party. There was very few language in this speech at the time we see an attack on black history, attack on DEI. The end of the BLM racial reckoning thing has come to a complete end because there was nothing in this speech for that. Our movement has never been grounded in two-party politics in this country. All of our movements ultimately get co-opted by a state that is anti-black. They called the old because they knew the way, and they called the young because they were strong. And I believe there is a good combination of that, but we can have ideas and we can have visions and dreams, but we have to have our young people also working beside us because they are strong, and they will run that race, and they will run it to the end. Activists, organizers, and young people have been pushing this administration to be on the right side of history and to do something about the issues that they care about. While the Ukraine and Palestine are critical issues. They are not the only global issues. Not a single black person who should ever let it come out their mouth that I'm tired. Because there is somebody else who came before us who didn't stop fighting. All right, folks, back to the call to here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraj Muhammad, checking in with Dr. Bridget for this week's Reclaim Your Wellness segment as we talk about the bias testing for kidney transplant. And this has gotten the chat, Doc. A lot of people mm-hmm. in the chat are just, you know, are, you know, taking all this information in and, and really questioning a lot of things. There are two things that I want to bring to the table or to, to your attention. But first, let me go to what McCole had asked. She said, question for Dr. Bridget, why is it that it's approximated 30% of African-Americans have kidney disease? Why is that the number? So I think kidneys, a lot of kidney disease starts also with diabetes and other health conditions. And, you know, uh, Raji, as you started the show, you were talking about the fact that it's hard for us to get diagnosed. It's hard for us to have um, adequate health care. And so there's a number of things that go into this. But unfortunately, if you do not have adequately treated hypertension, um, diabetes, uh, cholesterol issues, that can lead into kidney failure as well. So there's a number, there's a number of different uh, conditions that lead to the kidney failure. And without adequate treatment, that's where we end up. There we go. Uh, if we're not getting adequate treatment um, and we're not having, and it's harder for us to have these conversations with the doctors and with these healthcare institutions, my question is, Doc, who do we turn to for that level of advocacy? Yes, we, you're, you're right. We need to advocate for ourselves, but that also requires us to become knowledgeable, to, to really understand ourselves, our condition, do the necessary research and go through that process. But is there anyone that we can advocate, that we can speak to, that will advocate on our behalf that we're in those spaces, we're not there. We're not at the, the National uh, um, you know, Kidney Foundation. We're not in those spaces when these algorithms are created. So are, is there a medical advocacy group that you can recommend? I mean, there is definitely the National Medical Association, which is the Association for Black Um, physicians and black providers. And so they have uh, an opportunity to actually speak to patients as well. So there's definitely that aspect of it. I highly recommend any time that you go into a physician's office that you have pen and paper, you might have your questions set ahead of time. You might ask sometimes for extra time. You could ask for that. Okay. Um, you want to be able to send an email sometimes saying, I have additional questions. You don't want to leave and not feel like you got your questions addressed. Bring someone with you because people tend to, be- to remember 30% of what the doctor says in any office visit. There are, um, you can also, when you go online, look up a condition and Google questions to ask the doctor about this condition, because sometimes the hard part is just not knowing what to ask. Mm. 
I like that. So, at, so it's easy to almost any condition you can possibly imagine. What questions should I ask the doctor about this condition? Yeah. Um, nowadays, if you do chat GPT, they'll answer it and put it in a nice form for you and everything else. So, um, but coming in with questions, because I do think that's the downfall, not knowing what to ask is where the, the, the problem really exist. And that's an easy thing to do so that you, it will get your mind in the frame of what you need to know. And of course you'll generate your own questions alongside of that. And you know what though, and, and I have to say this, uh, but I've heard stories and, you know, being, when you're in front of the doctor and you are the patient, you don't feel like it's a, it's a relationship where you're on equal footing, right? because the doctor, quote, 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 unquote, knows should know more than you about your condition. And so I think to your point is that, you know, I think that opens up the conversation about what type of relationship you have with your doctor where you can feel comfortable to mm -hmm. even pose questions. You can feel comfortable to having a conversation about your condition because some doctors, I mean, this is not because they're doctors, it's just because they're people. They could be complete assholes, you know what I'm saying? Like just coming across as like, well, no, this is the only option that you have. This is the only thing that we can do and it is what it is. Versus, you know what, here's, here's something, here are all the options and which, which option makes you feel most comfortable. And so doc, for something like this, especially for <clears throat> black families that are often marginalized, how do we overcome that part of the discussion? You know, if you don't know this, I think the big secret is that call the office and talk to the secretary, talk to the scheduler. People used to do this all the time in my office. People would call and say, I want someone I can relate to. I want someone I can ask, whatever it is that you want, you want someone to match you, hmm. talk to the secretary and that's, I'll, I was told that by the secretaries. People ask that all the time. That's how I ended up with, a huge, huge um, patient population that I had because they wanted someone that would stop and listen. Mm. As the secretary, they know. They deal with that office all day long. They know who will spend time and they know who is kind of short and, and abrupt. So uh, call the office and ask the secretary. Mm, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great recommendation. Never thought of that one. So Doc, thank you so much. Look, we're going to take a final pause. When we come forward, let's switch gears. Let's talk about how now, folks, there is a great concern that there is a drug shortage here in the United States. We're going to get Dr. Bridges' take on it. And what does that mean, mean for you, especially if you're already taking medication? So stay with us. That conversation is on the other side here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. All right, folks, welcome back to The Culture here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad, joined by our sister, our chief medical expert here on the show, great contributor, Dr. Bridget Cole Williams, for this week's Reclaim Your Wellness. And Dr. Bridget, let's talk about this other story that um, that is really getting a lot of discussion, which is there's a drug shortage that's reaching a record high in mm -hmm. the United States. There are more active drugs in the United States than ever, according to data from the American Society of Health System uh, Pharmacists and the University of Utah Drug Information Services. Um, when there is a huge drug shortage. And so yes. if there's a huge drug shortage in this country, what does that mean for patients? What does that mean for doctors? What does that mean for our pockets uh, moving forward? Absolutely. So with 
over 320 medications actively um, in shortage right now. This is something that's probably affecting nearly anyone that's taking pharmaceuticals. And if not, it will soon affect you um, in, in the time coming up. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this has been something that we've been tracking since 2001. It peaked in 2014 and it's been trending up since 2021. Um, the medications that tend to be most affected involve uh, generic sterile injectable drugs. So the uh, weight loss drugs um, are ones that are um, in shortage right now, but other ones are the cancer chemotherapy drugs, which is a huge, huge deal. The emergency medications that are in the crash carts of ERs, are in um, high demand and and uh, in low volume, and a lot of the ADHD medications are some of the ones that are um, affecting people. And so, with this being such a huge problem in the U.S., we're trying to find solutions to this uh, issue because if you're if you can't get your chemotherapy drugs, if you can't get the medication that's supposed to be in a crash cart, we're talking about uh, threatening people's lives. So with that, if there's a drug shortage, does that mean what? Like, how does that, how does that, what's the process here? So that means that less drugs will be prescribed. It's like a basic, simple supply demand type of, uh, type of relationship, or is there something else at play here? Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is there tends to be a greater demand for some of these medications and there tend to be issues with supply chain mm -hmm. as far as manufacturing and the quality of the drugs that are being created. And so everyone's affected, right? So physicians that are used to using certain medications that have found to be helpful for their patients are yeah. now either trying to find an equivalent drug to use in the meantime. Patients that have been used to using medications that have worked well for them can't get that medication any longer. And to be honest, the solution is not, not great. We don't have great solutions. So, 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 so the, here's the other side of it, Doc. The other side of it is there's a drug shortage um, right now for those 320 plus medications. Does that, how does that fit the holistic health uh, industry? Should we expect that there's going to be a greater demand for, for herbs and other, you know, other ingredients from that industry? Absolutely. I think there's a great frustration that builds, right? So if yeah. you've been used to using our pharmaceutical medications and they're no longer available, and let's say the other options just aren't adequate for you, then people will look for new solutions. And that leads people into more herbal medicine, more of the uh, vitamin and over-the-counter options. And for some people, this might actually really introduce them to a side of health and wellness they've never really uh, experienced before. But for other people, it might be an issue where there's they, their conditions are more severe and using herbal options uh, doesn't really work. So the only way to really deal with this right now is that the manufacturers, the hospitals, need to do more collaboration to be able to share the resources. If one is having a problem with a drug, they need to be able to work with their competitors to be able to see if they can solve some of these solutions. Yeah. And, um, you know, be aware that as supply, you know, a lot, we, a lot of us became aware of this during COVID because there are issues with supply chain and a lot of different industries. However, this has been something that's been growing for a while. I think a lot of people don't think this is something that happens in America, but the fact yeah. that most of our medications aren't made here either. So we need to be aware of our own health and what our options are. I really recommend to people, whether you have access to your regular medications or not, discover herbal options. Mm, and I like that. It. Because if you can eat your medicine, mm. then how much better is that, right? If you can live a healthier lifestyle so that you're less dependent on some medications, investigate and look into that. The fact of the matter is, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has us mentally dependent on what they offer. And I'm not anti-pharmaceutical, but I am pro-patient empowerment. 
And this mm. is an opportunity to empower yourself. And so that you're not so focused on the little pills. No, that's the, I love that. Discover herbal options. I love that. And I think that's a, that's a great recommendation. Um, and Nicole Smith is asking, can the government build a medicine factory so we don't have to depend on these private companies? Is this an opportunity for us to redefine or reimagine a new, much more progressive, much more uh, life focused uh, healthcare industry to show that, you know what, too many of us in this country are dependent on the little white pill, right? Mm -hmm. To just get through the day. So mm -hmm. at this point, can we have some different conversations and in, 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 as Nicole is saying, to either nationalize some, some, some elements of the, uh, of the supply chain or to try to nationalize or try to, try to make sure that this, it doesn't become a thing where private companies can gain off of the health and sickness, off of the, the, the illness and sickness of individuals to the point where they might stop. They might say, we're, we're not making this drug raising the demand higher, charging larger, pri higher prices so they can reap rich on the other side or at the end of the quarter. Can there be something done in that respect, you think? You know, I mean, that idea of a more holistic approach to healthcare is part of the reason that I got into the cannabis space in the first place. I was listening to what my patients were asking. And so I was looking more at what, what are the options that we have available what can we do to empower patients? So I think on an individual basis, this is your opportunity. Um, as far as a more national healthcare, the pharmaceutical industry is so, so powerful in this country. Sure. Big that, um, I mean, we've learned before that the FDA is basically bought out by the pharmaceutical industry. And so I would love to say that you know, the country has our best interests at heart, but money talks a lot, despite what's going on, right? Mm. And so it would take a huge, huge um, push from the top down, you know, just like when something's going on with the automotive industry, it took the president to say, we're going to rescue them. If when something, you know, went on, when you have airlines that are missing flights and, you know, everything in between, it's from the top down to, uh, you know, make sure that airplanes are safe and that they're running on time. It would have to take from the top down to say, this is not appropriate for our people in this country, and we need to make a major change. But I have not heard that conversation yet. Do you, and I know we got a few moments left out, but, you know, this is an election season. Do you think mm. that any party is doing enough like who, who, who which party or which group of people is really doing the hard work of redefining and reimagining the healthcare system in this country or are we just in a state of malaise and management which is kind of keeping the ball going keeping the, the wheels turning but not necessarily doing anything innovative not taking america's healthcare system to the next level is there anybody that's really doing that work i mean the fact of the matter is you know we we worked really hard during the Obama administration to create better healthcare options. And a lot of it was hit with a lot of resistance. I think, um, I think our government's somewhat fatigued after dealing with that. I, I don't know, you know, they definitely provided more healthcare for more people, but I don't know how many people really feel like it's, they're better off because of it. Right. Um, I think they're fatigued when it comes to dealing with health care in this country. You know, historically, we never wanted national health care. The government never wanted national health care because they thought that not providing options for black people would actually make black people extinct and extinct in this country. You can look it up, but that's the way it happened. And I don't know if we've ever truly, truly recovered. I'm not saying that that's the mindset of everyone in government still, but uh, I think it might be our ground, it's what we are grounded in, it's what we have built in this country, that is our foundation, and that is what has, has allowed other industries, insurance industry, um, pharmaceutical industry to have so much control over our healthcare because the government actually bowed out and, um, and, you know, it's not working well at this point. Absolutely not. 
Absolutely, Knight, which is why I even brought up that last question of advocacy, because if we want to really see some things like we talk so much about the politics of things, right? But, you know, we, we talk about politics, we talk about education, we talk about guns, we talk about health only when there are major health emergencies, major health um, events. But when you look at behind the scenes of what's going on, like these policies, like we talked about with the transplant and algorithms and all of this stuff, it just seems like we are so far behind. And I've been reading that there are other countries that are much further along in their mm -hmm. health system than we are here in America. And I'm just like, they have less resources, certainly have less status, but they're further along. They're, they're people in other countries, and you can go to Cuba, you can go to Haiti. They're living way longer than Americans are. Yeah. And, it's, and, it, and it, it's a shame that even in this country, with all this te technology and science and all this innovation and all of this stuff is happening, that we're still seeing Americans dying at 50 and 60 years old, where in other places they're living further along. Now, some people might say, well, in my state, I do it. And that's part of the problem, I think. I think that this individualized state-oriented health policy sure. is part of the problem instead of the government saying, enough of that, we need to nationalize some things. But like you said, there's some fear that people are like, oh my gosh, this seems like socialism. This seems like, but guess what? Yeah. Are we getting healthier? Exactly. Like, what is the outcome? You know, um, I, I don't remember if we actually talked about it on the show or not, but Fat Joe, Rick Ross, Buster Rhymes, Method Man, a few others joined together to yep. create power to the patients. I don't know mm -hmm. if we really delved into that or not. No, we didn't. Um, but, uh, and maybe we'll talk about that next time and, and dig yeah. into it a little bit more. But they created an org organization to support patients in our very broken healthcare system. So we'll definitely follow up on that next time. Absolutely. Sean, Sean Ryan, you said other countries have good health care. We need to take the positive aspects of those countries and apply it to us. I would agree. The only problem is, Sean Ryan, arrogance, ego. America don't want to seem like she's getting new ideas, innovative ideas, ideas that could potentially work from other countries if she didn't think about it first. So, hey, I'm with you. We have to call for it, though. As we patients, do. as citizens, we have to say, put your ego aside, put our health first, and let's look at some other ways for us to get better. Dr. Yeah. Bridget, I appreciate you as always. What's the best way folks can find you on social media? Always go to Instagram at Dr. Bridget MD or on Facebook, Dr. Bridget MD, Cole Williams, and you'll see whatever I'm working on at the time. That's what I'm talking about. Dr. Bridget, make sure y'all follow her on all social media platforms. She always have her after chats that happens each and every week and throughout. Mm -hmm. and, and she's always talking about healthy relationships. So, And of course, y'all know she's one of our great cannabis experts on the show that talks to us about the pros and the cons, folks. I don't think she come on over here just giving us the boo-boo about cannabis. She's like, look, I'm going to give you both. I'm just, you make the decision on how you want to move forward. And we truly, truly appreciate her for all the insights she brings. Dr. Bridget, thank you for being so good for the culture. Absolutely. Thank you, Faraji. Absolutely. You're welcome. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. I thank each and every one of you for being a part of the, con the conversation. Crew, y'all know how we do. We just kicking off this week. We still got a lot to talk about later on this week. We watch and keeping our eyes open on this Trump situation. We're keeping our eyes open on this situation between Iran and Israel and how that's going to change the, the dynamic, the dynamic of war in Gaza. We're keeping our eyes open. Um, I got to talk a little bit about um, the efforts around the rebuilding of the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and how there are some folks that are advocating for that bridge to be renamed after some black uh some black history figures so we'll talk a little bit about that and so much more so we still got a lot to talk about this week make sure y'all go to our website at blackstarnetwork.com make sure y'all do your due diligence show your support any amount of support will be makes a world of difference so your support helps us to create this uh, this platform creates to establish this foundation to have these type of conversations again go to our website today at blackstarnetwork.com also, follow me on your social media at The Real Faraji on Instagram and at Faraji on the X platform. And I would love to connect and build community with you there. All right, folks, that thank you so much for tuning in. Stay tuned up next at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Big Brother Roland Martin and RMU is coming at you. As always, 
Never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we will be back tomorrow for another set of great conversations right here, only here, exclusively here on The Culture on the Black Star Network. Have a great evening. Talk to you soon. Peace.